Hi everyone and welcome to today's webinar, How to Communicate Sustainability to External Stakeholders. My name is Lucinda Broad and I'm the Community Manager for the Customer Engagement and Marketing Working Group here at Two Degrees and I'll be your host for this webinar. I'm very pleased to introduce you today to Nikki Kelly from the Campbell Soup Company who will be presenting. Now, just a few technical points before we kick off. Um, there's going to be some time for questions at the end. Um, and if you have any questions as we go along, just type them into the Q&A box, which you can find in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen, and pressing send. And if you have any technical problems throughout the webinar, if you just use the chat box on the right-hand send, uh, send to send me a message, um, just type your message and press send, and I'll get back to you. So I'm now going to hand over to Nikki for the first part of today's session. Over to you, Nikki. All right, thanks, Lucinda. So I'm delighted to be able to share a little bit of my journey in CSR reporting at Campbell. So I'm going to start, I'll just give you a brief overview of Campbell's CSR program, how we're structured, and then I want to share with you how, why, and what we report, and include a little bit of the overview of um, our reporting process. And then finally, I'll talk to you a little bit about some of the best practices and challenges in CSR reporting. So just briefly about Campbell Soup Company, we are a global food manufacturer headquartered in Camden, New Jersey. Our net sales are about $8 million and we have 17,500 employees in about 20 countries. We're best known for our Campbell Soups, but other products include V8 Juices, Pepperidge Farm products, and several international brands. And most recently, we've expanded our product portfolio to include Bolt House Farms, carrots, premium juice beverages, and salad dressings, as well as Plum Organics baby food. So CSR and sustainability at Campbell, they're integrated into our business strategies. And our formal CSR program began about five years ago. When we developed this program, we felt that it was important to have a mission and to define CSR and sustainability so that we could communicate our message consistently. So here you will see our CSR mission and how we define CSR and sustainability. So if we start with our mission, it's to deliver meaningful, measurable, and differentiated business, brand, and societal value by optimizing and leveraging the power of Campbell people culture, core competencies, and innovation against some of our community's principal challenges. And as you know, there are hundreds of definitions for CSR out there, but we chose to define CSR in a way that included all of our employees and fit our values. So we define CSR and sustainability as integrated business platforms that leverage our commitment to environmental stewardship healthy communities, and employee engagement to build long-term share owner value, foster innovation, drive operational efficiency, improve environmental performance, reduce cost, strengthen our employees' relationships with our customers, and ultimately create a business advantage. So as you can see by this definition, we wanted to make sure that CSR and sustainability were fully integrated to all aspects of our business. So when we first created this program, one of the first steps was to define our focus areas and our goals. So consistent with our corporate mission statement of nourishing people's lives everywhere, every day, we call our CSR program Nourishing. And we developed four focus areas, which are nourishing our consumers, our neighbors, our employees, and our planet. And in each of these areas, we developed 2020 destination goals, which are the, the four goals that you see under each of the pillars. So for example, our 2020 destination goal in the area of the planet was to cut the environmental footprint of our product portfolio in half. And then on the right-hand side, you'll see some of our selected sub-goals in each of these categories. We felt that this was essential because you cannot manage what you don't measure. So then we had to figure out how we were going to implement and manage our CSR program and strategy. So this is our small but mighty team. We are led by our VP of Public Affairs and Corporate Responsibility, Dave Stangus. And I manage our CSR program office, and we also have a sustainability analyst who bridges the gap between the program office 
in our environmental sustainability group, which if you look at the slide, you'll notice environmental does not sit with us. And then we have two other pillars, which is our community affairs programming. That's all of our volunteer efforts and philanthropic. And then we have a director of our signature healthy communities program. So clearly, we can't accomplish everything with our small team. And so we have to rely on a number of different business units throughout the year to accomplish these strategies. So a little bit about my job as the CSR Program Office Manager. I produce our annual CSR report, which is a majority of um, my time. And I also complete a number of investor profiles and ratings and rankings questionnaires throughout the year, sometimes as many as 20. And another big part of my job is stakeholder engagement and advocacy management. I feel that it's essential for a CSR program to consistently engage with stakeholders and, and manage um, adv advocacy groups. And then finally, I engage with our sales team on customer and supplier surveys. So now we had to figure out exactly what to report. So a large majority of my time is spent producing the report. When I first started doing this, I thought that there was no way that it would take so much time and effort to produce a report, but quickly learned that it's a lengthy process that requires a lot of effort and determination. So I thought it would be helpful to explain the basis of our report. So you can't just randomly report on a bunch of stuff. It needs to be well thought out and planned. So for the past four years, we've based our report on the Global Reporting Initiative Framework. While this is not a required framework, it provides excellent guidance for what should be in a CSR report. And a part of that requirement of the GRI framework is the materiality analysis. So right now, we are actually in the process of planning this year's CSR report and planning what will go into our materiality process. This year it will likely include a variety of stakeholder surveys and interviews, an internal engagement session with our content owners and other internal stakeholders, and we're also looking at the possibility of a stakeholder engagement panel which will include, include both internal and external experts. And then we will work with our content owners to determine what's important to them and what stories they want to tell. And aside from the proactive materiality process, we also receive feedback from our stakeholders throughout the year that we will compile and take into consideration. This feedback comes from our consumer affairs group and through our CSR feedback mailbox. And then finally, some of our content is based on required disclosures and some of the investor profiles that we complete throughout the year such as the Dow Jones Sustainability Index, IW Financial, IRIS, and others. So in essence, our report serves multi-purposes. So that's pretty much how we determined what to report. So as I mentioned, our content owners are a key element in our reporting and informs what goes into our CSR report. So throughout the year, I work with about 15 different content owners. And as you can see on this slide, this is a sampling of some of the topics that are covered in our report. They include diversity and inclusion, safety, procurement, transportation, nutrition, and a variety of other topics. And while these content owners are experts in their areas, the CSR report does not fall within their core accountabilities. So it takes a lot of work to get them to understand the importance of reporting and I have to do my best to make the reporting process as painless as possible for these content owners. So now this slide gives you an overview of what the reporting process looks like. This is a very condensed version, but I'll go through the process briefly. So for us, we do a full report every other year with a, just a update of our performance data in the interim years. So if you look to our website now, you will see the 2013 performance update of our report. And our next full report will be produced in 2014. 
So typically we produce our report in May or June, but for those of you are, who are in this space, know that that's a busy time of year with multiple due dates, including Dow Jones Sustainability Index and Carbon Dis Disclosure Project. So this year we are moving our production date up so that the core of the process will run from July to February. So as you can see, it's not a quick overnight process. Our process begins with benchmarking and researching. We spend quite a bit of time looking at what others are doing, what they are reporting, and how CSR reports are changing and where our report falls short. Then we hire a designer to help come up with the color scheme and overall design of the report. And we're actually in the middle of that process as we speak. And then we move into defining the content and performing the materiality analysis and gathering data. So this is a huge area and it takes a lot of time. And once we have that defined, we also look to fill the gap. So where are we missing areas within the GRI guidelines? And then finally, we put the content through a variety of reviews, including reviews by our legal and global communications team. And then finally, we publish the report. So we do a full version in the form of a website and a downloadable PDF, and we also do a small executive summary. And once the report is published, we communicate, and not just immediately after, we communicate year-round. So how do we do this communications? So last year's report, or the 2012 report, was a good example of a communications campaign that we ran around our reporting. So we started out with a series of blogs that came out leading up to the publication of the report. For this, we had several of our content contributors do blogs to give a sneak peek at what was going to be in the report. Then we published a press release on the day of the launch. And then finally, we did a social media campaign which included a tweet chat where our team manned our Twitter account for about an hour and responded to many questions from our stakeholders. And for those of you who follow us on Twitter, you know that we love to engage with our stakeholders. So I put our Twitter handles on, the, on this slide and our team jointly manages the CSR Twitter account and then we all have our personal handles. So if you don't follow us, feel free to do so. We love to engage. So now I thought I would share with you what I feel are the top 10 best practices in CSR reporting. So the first one is to follow a framework such as GRI. This helps to define what should go into the report. It helps to streamline reporting and without a framework such as this, reporting can definitely be a monster. Second is to focus on material issues. So as I previously mentioned, a materiality assessment is key to defining the main items that should be included in a report. If we included every little issue in the CSR report that's in the CSR world, our report would be about 300 pages and no one would ever read that. Third, know your audience. As you may have noticed, stakeholders are a key ingredient to CSR reporting. It's important to understand who re reads your report and why they read it. We try to make sure that our report is balanced and has the information that all of our stakeholders are interested in, whether it's our employees, investors, or consumers. Fourth, create a user-friendly website. I feel that this is very important because if your website is not user friendly or if it's hard to locate, no one will ever read your report. So why bother reporting? If someone comes to your website and they can't easily find what they're looking for, they get frustrated and they quit looking. So for us, I take pride in the fact that when someone is looking for a particular item, whether it's a sustainability metric or a human resources metric, they can easily find it. Fifth, engage through storytelling and charts. Again, the audience for CSR reports is varied, and people who read them are looking for different things, so it's important to appeal to all, all audiences. So for us, we use a variety of stories, 
charts and videos in our report so that we make it easily understandable for everyone. Six, be transparent. Today it's more important than ever to be transparent. And if you've been in the CSR world for a while, you know that that's really an emerging trend. So for us, it was a challenge in the beginning, but I feel that it's all about building trust in your company's leaders, developing relationships, and helping them understand the importance of transparency. Seventh, report progress against goals in a multi-year format. So going back to the importance of initially creating those goals, it's important to show year-over-year -year progress in an easy-to-read format. It's much easier for stakeholders to quickly look at a chart than to have to dig through information to find out if you've actually made progress. Next, work effectively with internal and external partners. So for the person such as myself who is preparing this report and managing the report, it's extremely important to develop great relationships with all of your partners, whether it's your internal content owners or external vendors. Without these good relationships, a CSR, CSR reporting project can quickly turn into a nightmare. So ninth, create a report that can solve, serve many purposes. So for me, this is something that's extremely important as well. I work hard to gather all of the information that I will need for many of my investor questionnaires at the same time that I'm working on the CSR report, and I include that information in the report. This makes it easier for me and the content owners. And I also use this report as a means to house information that has required disclosure by many organizations such as Dow Jones Sustainability Index, IW Financial, and other investors. And finally, consistent communications is key. Again, I can't stress how important it is to consistently communicate with your stakeholders year-round, not just when the CSR report is published. So now, just a few challenges. So I'm sure many of you know that gathering data is a huge challenge, particularly if you're a large global company. So I've had to work hard over the past several years to put in place methods of gathering data and ensuring that we are reporting the same thing year over year. It's a challenge, but one of the things that I've learned to do is to document who the data came from and how it was derived. So for example, sometimes the final numbers come from formulas. If the person who derived that formula leaves the company and those formulas were not documented, then we have to start from scratch. And I've run into that issue a couple of times. So now, every time I get data, I make sure that, it, that I have full documentation of where that data came from and how that data was derived. And content owner engagement, I mentioned that earlier. So when CSR reporting is not your number one priority and it's not in your annual performance objectives, it often falls to the bottom of your to-do list. And that's where building great relationships and top-down support are essential. Reporting fatigue, this is another challenge. And as I previously mentioned, for the past several years, a majority of my work was due all in the spring. So it's important to find a way to manage that work. That's why we are moving our reporting cycle up this year so that we can finish the report and then focus on all of the other things that are due in the spring. And it's also important to determine what surveys and questionnaires you want to respond to. In the beginning, I wanted to respond to everything, but if I did that, I don't think I would ever sleep or take a vacation. So we've had to pare those down and determine which ones are really important to our company. And next, I mentioned transparency previously, and this is a continuous challenge. Sometimes companies do not want to share a lot of information and data that's requested by a variety of agencies, and this has been something that we've had to work at. Fortunately, we sit in the legal department, so we've been able to build great relationships there. But my advice is to work hard to build trust in your legal and leadership teams. 
And finally, emerging trends. So simply stated, it's hard to keep up on all of the emerging trends. As you saw, we are a small team, and I'm sure that many of you are in the same boat. I'm constantly reading to keep up, especially in the age of age of information overload and the growing CSR trends. So why do we do this? So why spend all the time to report? So for us, there are quite a few reasons. The first is competitive advantage through reputation. In the past four years since our program was formally developed and we've been doing a lot of reporting, we've achieved significant recognition, including being named to the Global 100 this past year, and we've been number one in our sector on the 100 Best Corporate Citizens list for the past two years. And second, improved consumer trust is extremely important. So consumers are aware of our CSR and sustainability story, and they love to engage with us, and we love to engage with them. And we've also seen improved stakeholder engagement. We constantly engage with our stakeholders. We work with advocacy groups to engage with them and listen to their issues and try to reach some common understandings. And, and next, talent attraction and retention are very important. So millennials in particular are engaged in CSR and sustainability, and they want to work for companies who have strong CSR programs. And we also see strong employee engagement in driving CSR and sustainability strategies. So at our world headquarters location, we have a sustainability network that really is a grassroots organization of employees who love CSR and sustainability. And they volunteer their time to drive some of our efforts. And we start off with new hire orientation. So when our employees start at Campbell, we do an orientation program and we give a presentation on CSR and sustainability. And we offer ways in which employees can get engaged in our efforts. And then finally, improved investor relations. So over the past several years, we have made significant process in this area, including increased scores in our Dow Jones Sustainability Index and IW Financial. So that's pretty much the story of CSR reporting, how we engage, and um, how we do our communications in CSR and sustainability. So now I look forward to questions. Great, thanks Nikki. Um, okay, so as I mentioned earlier, if you have any questions for Nikki, please post them in the Q&A box, which you can find on the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. So just type it in and press send, and we'll address those before the end of the session. So I've got a couple of questions coming already. Um, the first is from Marissa, who says, does Campbell's produce their report in-house, or do they outsource it to a third-party firm? We use a third party for a third party firm to produce our report. So our content is developed in house. We typically write the report, but we use another firm to design the report. Great, thank you. And um, another question from Marissa. Does Campbell's use a special software for gathering and housing data, or is it just in Word docs and Excel sheets? So we have a couple of different forms. So our environmental data, we do use an environmental management system that houses that data. The rest of the data is an Excel spreadsheet. So that's a work in progress. And our goal down the road would be to have one system that housed all of that data. Sure. Um, OK, the next question. Are there any food and drink publications which you would recommend to liaise with regards to sharing your sustainability story through trade or consumer publications? Hmm. <laughs> That's a tough one. I mean, we, we're engaged with, I mean, several different organizations. You know, the FMI and GMA here. Um, but And we do engage with other publications that reach out to us to share our story. Okay, sure. Um, and how do you measure feedback on your report? So 
So there are a couple of different ways. As I mentioned, we have a, an email box that is csrfeedback at kembelsoup.com, and we get questions in there throughout the year, and we take that feedback and we incorporate it into the CSR report. Our consumer affairs hotline actually gets questions throughout the year, and they compile that data and give it to us as well. And then finally, our report, um, at the end of the report, there is a link to a survey, and we take that feedback and put it in our report as well. Okay. Now we've got another question just come in. Um, do you do a materiality assessment every year before reporting season? We do not. So as I mentioned before, we do a full report every other year, and that's when we do the materiality assessment. If we did it year-round, it would just be too big of a burden. But we, again, we do take the feedback throughout the year and incorporate it into our report. Okay, thank you. Um, our next question is from Denver, who says, in compiling their reports, how did Campbell's choose key stakeholders to engage with? So, for example, internal and external. So our internal key stakeholders are pretty easy. We know we want to engage all of our different business units, whether it's our global nutrition team, environmental, safety, health and wellness, um, and all of those teams. External stakeholders, I mean, if you're in the CSR space, you pretty much know that you want to engage with your customers, your consumers. Advocacy groups are a big one because, you know, as a food manufacturer, we're up against many different challenges, and we know that it's important to take that feedback from our stakeholders and incorporate it. Okay, great. Um, and Martin asks, what has been your biggest personal CSR achievement in terms of communications? I think, I think just being able to continuously improve the CSR reporting. So my background is not CSR. I've been doing this for about four years, and I was able to quickly get up to speed and start producing the report on my own. And a CSR report is a monster of a project. You really have to be a great project manager. You really have to be good with people. You have to be able to help your content owners and other stakeholders understand why that this is important to the company. So I think my biggest achievement is being able to produce this report and get the information out there and produce what I feel is a pretty good report. Yeah, I've worked on a, a report myself, and I know how <laughs> how time-consuming they are, so <laughs> respect to you for doing it on your own. Um, we've had a question in from Laurie, who says, how do you think the new DRI G4 guidelines will change your report and or reporting process? So we are actually, I'm actually in the process of reading the guidelines now, and, you know, in the beginning, it would have been easy for us to say we're just not going to be bothered. But I think it's going to challenge some of our internal stakeholder groups. So the the new guidelines focus heavily on supply chain. So we'll take those guidelines and we'll go back to our procurement group and we'll really push them on se several of the issues. So that's another thing that the guidelines do for us. They help us go to our internal business units and show them where there are gaps and where we need to improve our processes. Okay, um, so we've got time for just a few more questions. So if you do have a question, get it in quick. I, I um, have a couple here too. Do you have the ones that I have? Um, possibly not. So uh, yeah, go go ahead and <laughs> have a go on to me. Okay, I'm going to read a couple. Um, so the first one is you talked about top-down support what support for CSR and sustainability do you have from the board, and how visible and vocal are they in communicating commitment to all employees? So we do have top-down support. Our CEO is very engaged, and she's really behind this. Our CSR and sustainability strategies are part of the overall business strategy. And our VP of 
Public Affairs and our VP of Sustainability report to our board of directors each year, and they're really engaged in what we're doing. And then I have one more that says, you mentioned a panel of stakeholders. What stakeholder groups are represented on this panel? How will the panel help with CSR reporting and communications? So my answer is, I haven't developed that panel yet. That's something that I'm thinking about doing. But ideally, I would pull together external stakeholders, such as maybe um, consumers, customers, um, CSR experts, and I would put them on a panel and talk to them about what we've reported in the past, what we need to improve upon, and if there are any issues that we're missing that should be included in our report. And I feel that this really will help, one, with engaging our stakeholders further, and two, in better informing what needs to be included in our report. Okay, great. Um, we've had another question in from Denver, who says, how did Campbell's get board buy-in for allocation of budget for CSR and sustainability projects and programs? So this, this program started five years ago when Dave Stangus was brought in to develop the CSR program for Campbell. So at that point in time, it was something that, that the CEO, Doug Conant, at that time, thought was important. And we understand that it's important for the company's reputation, for competitive advantage. And so that's how the program started. And it started with one person. And as Dave has developed the strategy and began to implement the strategy, the company has realized more so than ever that this is important. So as you can see by our small org chart, we've actually grown from the one person of Dave to our larger group today. Cool. And um, just a question from me, actually. Um, I know lots of our members are very interested in how to use social media for sustainability uh, messages. And um, I know you spoke about how you've got one from the company and then individual accounts as well. Um, so how do, what do you find is the most sort of popular social media post um, in your experience, what gets the most sort of retweets and that kind of stuff? Well, I think actually our community programming, we get a lot of social media activity from that. So we're very active in our philanthropic activities and our volunteer activities, particularly here in our hometown of Camden, New Jersey. And a lot of our nonprofit groups that we support are actually now on Twitter. So we engage with them quite a bit through social media. So I would say it's really our community programming that gets a lot of activity there. Okay. Cool. Um, well, I don't think I've got any other questions coming in on my side. Have you got any come through directly to you? No, I think that's it. Okay. Well, I think that brings it to a close then. Um, thanks so much for your time. I thought that was a really interesting presentation and obviously a very busy role that you've got at Campbell's, um, but an interesting one. Um, You're welcome. So, <laughs> um, so thanks for joining everyone. And uh, we have been making a recording of this as we've been going along. So I'll be posting that up on Two Degrees tomorrow along with the slides. Um, and I'll send you the link to that once they're live. Um, and if you do have any questions for Nikki um, after, afterwards, if you think of anything that you wish you'd thought of, um, either email Nikki directly at the email address on your screen or um, get in touch with me and I can forward that on for you. Um, so thanks very much for joining and um, I look forward to seeing you on another webinar soon. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Thank you. Bye-bye.